This is the video lecture on gross income inclusions. In some of our previous videos, we've talked about the tax formula for calculating taxes and the fact that the IRS defines income as income from whatever source derived. So we're now going to talk about income in more detail and specifically all the various things that have to be included within income. So these would be things that we would have to report to the IRS as income, and we would also include these on our tax return. Now there is a section in the IRS code, a section 61, and it does provide a very general list of items that are considered to be income, but the IRS specifically says that it is not uh, considered to be an all-inclusive list. It's merely a list of suggestions because, of course, there are many, many different types of income that an individual could have. And depending upon the individual that you're working with, you may see you know, quite a bit of variety of different income sources. But we're just going to talk about some of the major sources of income that you can expect to see and all the ones that would have to be included. So under the general items of income, we start off with the most obvious. And for most individuals, it's simply going to be compensation from a job. You know, it's going to be compensation from services that they have provided. And they will receive that compensation either through fees that they've received, a salary, hourly wages, commissions, things of that nature. So these are the most obvious sources of income that most people have from their job. But then as you move down the list, you get into some other items of income that, although they may not be as obvious, they are still fairly common and they do have to be included in income. And of course, business income, anybody that has a business, if it's a proprietorship or a partnership, we said that there's no separation between the individual and the business. So that income has to be reported. Also, gains on sale of property. Anytime you sell property at a gain, that has to be reported as income. Also, interest. You might have interest from a bank account. You could have interest from a CD, from a bond. There are many different instances where people have invested money and have received interest, so that is considered income. Rent is considered income. You might have uh, houses that you own, or apartments, or facilities, and any rent revenue that you receive, that must be reported. Royalties. It could be royalties from coal, natural gas. It could be royalties from uh, intellectual property like a song or a book, any kind of royalty payments that you receive, that would be considered income. And also dividends. You could have dividends that you receive from stocks that you have invested in. So this is by no means an all-inclusive list of all the things that are considered income, but it's just merely a list of the major sources of income that you often see from individuals. Now this next list, again, not an all-inclusive list, but this is what we would call other income items. And these are items that are included in income, and they may not be as obvious, they may not happen as often, but they are considered to be income, and there are certain special uh, stipulations that are included. So we're going to talk about each one of these in more detail, but they include alimony, social security, pensions, discharge of debt, insurance proceeds, and court awards. So to look at each one of these in more detail, we'll start off with alimony. Now if a person is divorced and they receive alimony payments, it depends upon how they receive those payments and how the payments are classified. If the payments that they receive are classified as alimony, alimony is considered to be taxable income. So that portion of it would have to be included. 
but any portion of it that has been designated as child support, child support is not considered income. So that's why you see the distinction there, why it's so important. The child support component is not taxable. And also the same thing with property settlement. A lot of times in a divorce situation, a person will receive property or maybe they'll receive money from selling property. And that's not considered income. That's just considered a settlement. That's just considered their own property that they're getting the value from. So that's why it's important to make that distinction. So any money that a person receives pursuant to a divorce agreement, any part of it that is stipulated a settlement of property or child support, it's off the table, it's not taxed. But any part of it that's designated as alimony, that is considered taxable income. In terms of Social Security, if the person receives Social Security benefits, that may or may not be taxable. It's going to depend upon provisional income. In other words, all the other uh, forms of income that they have. And it's also going to depend upon their AGI. So in that case, you would actually have to work with a, an IRS worksheet and you would have to look at how high the person's other items of income are and that would determine how much of the Social Security is taxable. And if the person's income is low enough, it's possible that none of it will be taxable. If the income is high enough or falls into certain thresholds, maybe part of it or maybe even all of it will be taxable. So that is just calculated on a case-by-case -case basis. And then of course you have pensions. And a lot of people receive uh, payments from a pension plan and whether or not it's taxable it depends upon the type of plan that it is. And of course it's always good to know some of the terminology that is associated with these pension plans. And first of all, you have an annuity. And those of you that have dealt with uh, time value of money calculations, you should already be very, very familiar with what an annuity is. An annuity is a annual payment that you receive over and over again, recurringly over the years. And of course, you could purchase an annuity on your own, you could purchase an annuity through your employer. And the question comes up, is that taxable? It depends. It depends upon what age you were when you bought the annuity. And it depends upon how much you paid for it. Because remember, when you get those annuity payments, part of that is your own money that you're getting back. Part of it is the interest that you've earned. So generally, the portion that's taxable is the, po the portion that is above and beyond what you paid for, the actual interest portion. Then you have the 401k. And of course, the tax implication there is that the money that you put into the 401k is not taxed, but when you begin receiving distributions from the 401k, it is taxed. And then the last two under pensions would be the IRAs. And of course, IRA stands for Individual Retirement Account, and you could have a regular IRA and a Roth IRA. The difference is with a regular IRA, you do not pay taxes on money that is contributed to the plan, but you do pay taxes when you receive the distributions. Whereas with the Roth IRA, it's the opposite. You do pay taxes on the money as it is invested. You do not pay taxes on the distributions that you receive. So if it's an IRA, regular IRA, those distributions are taxable. If it's a Roth IRA, those distributions are not taxable. So that's why on each individual person, you'd have to look at the type of pensions that they receive and look at it on a case-by-case -case basis and determine how much of that is taxable. The next income item is discharge of debt. And believe it or not, the IRS does say that discharge of debt is considered income. So in other words, you are indebted to someone or to some entity 
and you are forgiven of that debt or it is discharged, you would report that amount as income. The only way really to get out of that is to say that it is a family gift. So in other words, it's someone in your family and maybe they had lent you money and then they as a gift decided to just forgive you of the debt and not make you pay it back. You could get out of, of uh, reporting that. But otherwise, if it's the actual discharge of debt, that is considered taxable income. Now, insurance proceeds. You may have an insurance policy and you might suffer some type of a loss or some type of an incident or an accident. And as a result, you might receive proceeds from that insurance policy. If you receive those proceeds, then the question is, do you report that as income? It depends. It depends upon what the proceeds are for. If it's for reclamation, then that just simply means that the proceeds are compensating you for something that you lost. For example, your car was damaged and you received money to replace the car. Well, if that's the case, that's not income because that is just simply replacing an item that you had lost. But if the insurance proceeds cover lost wages, that is taxable because the wages themselves would have been taxable. So that's the way we would interpret that on the insurance proceeds. And then on the court awards, it's possible that you might have an action that t is taken to court. And as a result, if you win, you might receive damages or you might receive monetary awards from the court. Is that taxable? It depends. It depends on whether or not it is compensatory or punitive. Now, when you see the word compensatory, that sounds like compensation, and that's exactly what compensatory comes from. A compensatory damage is simply compensating you for something that you lost, so that's not taxable. But when you look at punitive, it sounds like the word punish, and that's exactly what it comes from. Punitive damages are awarded to you to punish the other party and to give you extra above and beyond what you lost. So that is taxable. So just to make up a quick example, say that you uh, had an incident where you lost something that was worth $10,000, but the court awards you 15000 And 10 of that is compensatory, 5 of it is punitive. Well, the punitive portion of it, that would be reported as income. Compensatory is not reported. And then the last thing, dividing income between spouses. Of course, if you're married, you've got the option of filing joint or filing separate. Well, if you file joint, then you don't have to worry about who made what income. It's all lumped together. But if you make the decision to file separately, then you would actually have to make a decision about who's going to report what income on whose tax return. So the way that income would be divided actually depends upon the state in which you live. Some states are community property states and others are common law. In a community property state, the income is divided equal 50-50. In a common law state, it is divided based upon who earned the income. So like I said, that's a distinction that you only have to worry about in cases where the spouses decide to file separately. So if it's community property, they literally would add all the income together, cut it in half, half goes to one, half goes to the other. But in common law states, they would actually look at the detail of who earned what income, and they would report that on their individual returns.